Now we saw last time already that the course and quality of our lives are determined more by the personal decisions and choices we make than by the circumstances we find ourselves in as believers. Christian living especially involves a constant making of choices. Either for good, and hopefully it's good most of the time, but it could also be for bad. Either for Jesus Christ or for the world. In fact, you can see the maturity of a Christian by the decisions he or she makes. And according to the Bible, holiness, living God's way, is always the right choice. And carnality or worldliness, on the other hand, is always the wrong choice. I used, the, I used this example last time. Uh, when Satan tempts us, we decide either to say yes or to no, or, or no. And when we have opportunity to witness for the Lord, we either take advantage of it or we don't. And this may surprise you, but we decide, we choose whether we will make the time to read the Word of God and pray. So it's not a matter of having enough time. It's a matter of ruthlessly making the necessary time. And making that time requires a very definite decision in the right direction. It's the same in business or at work with our families and the Lord's work. Everything we do as believers involves decisions, making choices. And on the positive side, we can look at this and say, everything we do as the Lord's chosen people, every situation in our lives is an opportunity either to glorify God, or on the other hand, it could lead to disgracing and dishonoring his precious holy name. I remind you that we are looking at the choices that biblical faith makes from Hebrews chapter 11. And that is the kind of choices a person who is committed to Jesus Christ makes. So let's read together from Hebrews 11 and verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a far greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Now, biblical faith declines or refuses four things in its choices and it wholeheartedly accepts three other spiritual principles in its decision making. We saw last time that a person who truly loves the Lord and has biblical faith refuses the world's prestige. 
Now what I mean by that is this. Biblical faith is not too concerned with social honors. Verse 24. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, that's the choice there, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Then biblical faith also refuses the world's pleasure. Verse 25. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. The person with true spiritual vision knows that the pleasure of sin lasts only for a very short time. And that the wages of sin is always death in the end. If you've lived a while, you'll know this also as a Christian. You've been tempted to go in the wrong direction and you go and you discover death. That's the wrong way. It's for myself either. It's not for God, really. Even in ministry, the wages of sin is death. Today we discover that biblical faith also refuses the world's plenty. And we've already touched on, on this issue a bit last week. But I also want you to see that like in many cultures and countries in the world today, material gain was characteristic of ancient Egypt. Its riches and treasures were proverbial. Discoveries like the tomb of King Tutankhamun, who lived only about a hundred years after Moses, have shown us how vastly rich Egypt was at its peak. peak. About two years ago, we looked at the program, a documentary on television, about Tutankhamun and his coffin and his grave, it was absolutely overwhelming and astonishing to see what the people did when they buried kings. And living in Pharaoh's palace at the time, Moses had everything materially he could ever have wished for. He had access to a great deal of wealth and comfort. And most probably owned a lot himself. He literally had all the things this world holds so dear that he must have been very tempted to hold on to those things. But the amazing thing we discover is that he did not. Hebrews 11 verse 26, he regarded this grace. Now, NIV translates the word as regarded. A better translation here would be considered considered this grace, reproach, for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now the word translated by the NIV as regarded, as I said, it's better translated as considered, and the idea is that Moses carefully weighed up the pros and the cons <laughs> before he decided. It was not a spur of the moment thing. No, no, not so much. He weighed up the pros and the cons, and he did not make a hasty decision about this. He weighed up what Egypt had to offer against what God offered. And his conclusion was that God offered, what God offered was infinitely superior in every way. That the disgrace and reproach, that is the ridicule and the persecution every committed Christian must bear in this life, would be a worthy sacrifice to make for the abundant eternal riches and unspeakable joy of God that awaits believers in Jesus Christ. Moses believed with all his heart that the worst he could endure for Christ now was far more valuable than the best this world has to offer. 
that the glory that awaits us far outweighs the hardship true discipleship brings. God's reward is always far better and greater than the world's. Psalm 37 says it so well. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The days of the blameless are known to the Lord, and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. So don't get me wrong here. It's not a sin to be prosperous. Certainly not. If you look at some preachers and some television stations, I won't even mention them, uh, you would say that it's, when you're not financially prosperous, there's sin in your life. And that the Lord's purpose is to bless you financially. Well, I think that's a gross distortion. I hate the prosperity gospel because of that. It's not a sin to be prosperous. But it is a sin to love and worship worldly wealth and money. If we work hard and honestly and for God's glory and we become better off in the process, fine, great. But the moment we set our heart and mind on getting more and more treasures of this world, whatever that may be, we have the wrong motivation. The Apostle Paul said this to his spiritual son, Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. And he was obviously speaking about money and those things. So listen to this. He said from verse 8 there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith, pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, O oh man of God, flee from all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And that's a choice. In other words, if along the way God blesses us materially, wonderful. But if in his wisdom he keeps us poor, also wonderful. It should make no difference to us as long as we are in His will. As long as we are in His will. It made no difference to Moses. For 40 years enjoyed the wealth of Egypt. For the rest of his life he forsook it. He chose to leave it behind forever. That was for the next 80 years of his life. Why? Because they interfered with his obedience to God and they would have prevented him from receiving immeasurably greater wealth when it was time for eternal rewards. John MacArthur tells a story of, uh, he just quotes it, uh, Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice. And you'll get the story very easily. I know not many of us know Shakespeare and so, but this story you will get. Portia, a beautiful, wealthy heiress, or heiress, is the heroine of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. There were many men of noble descent who wanted to marry her. You see her, the princess, and everybody wanting to marry her, all the men. But her father's will decreed that her husband should be chosen by a certain test. She would belong to the one who chose the white chest out of the three that were prepared. What is a chest? 
box. You could open and close. <coughs> One chest was made of gold. On it was inscribed, Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. And inside was a skull, a human skull. The second chest, chest was of silver with the inscription, Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. And inside was the picture of a fool. The wooden chest was made of lead and held Portia's picture. On the outside was the inscription, Who chooses me must give and hazard all he has. All the men except Bassanio chose the one, the first chose one of the, uh, uh, the first two chests because of the precious metals. Sorry. And the inscriptions were so attractive. Bassanio picked the one of lead and got Portia's hand in marriage because he was willing to give everything he had for the sake of the one he loved. My brother and sister, the person who truly loves the Lord is not hung up on material gain. He can't possibly be. Jesus said it. You know, Jesus' words are disturbing, to say the least. Matthew 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's impossible. And it is as simple as that. The person who has biblical faith, who is truly committed to the one true master, Jesus Christ, does not believe the philosophy of our time that says, Blessed are you if you can only have this thing or this status or this pleasure or this power for yourself. Whatever that thing or status or pleasure or power may be. That's the philosophy of materialism. Now the man, woman or child who truly loves Christ, who is truly committed to Christ, is willing to forsake and even hazard, as Shakespeare said, all they have for the sake of Christ and his kingdom, if that is what God wants. Even their possessions, even their families, even their own lives, if the Lord calls them to do so. The call of Jesus Christ for every true believer is that we must love him more than life itself. That is radical. And it's very difficult to accept sometimes. But it is the truth. How did Jesus put it? Uh, we find it difficult to read a few verses like this from, from the Gospels um, in our day. But listen to Jesus, not me, Jesus. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, that's Luke 14, verse 25. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yet even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciples. Now, what Jesus is saying here is that our love for our families, and our worldly possessions, our children, all those people, even for ourselves, must look like hate in comparison to our love for him. You see, it's 
true. We must love one another. That is so. On a human level, we do. And we must. We are commanded to do so. But we may not worship. Love to the extent that we worship any created thing. And that has been so from the beginning. You should be willing to forsake everything for Christ at any time if God calls you to. And knowing with Moses of old and the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And again, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Moses carefully considered and then chose this grace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Why? Because he was looking ahead to his reward. He was seeing him who is invisible. And maybe this is a real issue here. What is the, what is the kind of reward we seek? Because we all seek that. A permanent one? Or temporary ones? An eternal one or worldly ones? A visible one? Or invisible ones? An imperishable one or perishable ones? Not this. Satan wants you to hold on to tempi, the temporary rewards of this life. Because just like a soap bubble can have the ability to be very attractive and fascinating and to wow you. Wow, mommy, look at that soap bubble for a second or two, that is. Then its joy and glory is over forever. So is the rewards of this life. Satan knows that if he can turn your desires and your focus on a temporary reward, he has already succeeded in his wicked plan. He wants you to be disappointed. He wants you to be disgraced and even condemned forever. Moses considered carefully that his grace for the sake of Christ is a far greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his eternal reward. And let me tell you, great was Moses' reward, or is. Part of it was seeing the deliverance of the, his people from the bondage in Egypt, the Israelites. That was the reward for his faithfulness. God graciously showed him some fruit for his labor. But even there, there was a huge problem. Even that reward had its curses and problems and discouragement. The bubble burst a few times for Moses, even in things spiritual, as it has for me. Remember, the Israelites were a very difficult bunch of people to deal with. Believe me, they gave Moses all his days. Go and read Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and you will see what I mean. So I want to tell you that Moses was, was not so much looking ahead to his rewards from the Israelites and this life. He was expecting something far better 
his ultimate reward from God, his eternal Father, the reward he now has in the victorious, blissful presence of Jesus Christ in heaven. And his reward is so great that we don't even have an inkling of what it must be like for him in glory now. Yes, there's joy and rejoicing through the presence of God's precious Holy Spirit in us here on earth. Praise God for Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. The birth of the New Testament church took place. People were made alive in Christ. Their eyes were opened to the Father and the Son. But the truth is that now we can't even experience a millionth of the joy and bliss the faithful child of the Lord receives in glory. So I want to say, let us fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Remember Moses, he made the right choice, the choice of biblical faith. He rejected the world's prestige, he rejected the world's pleasure, he rejected the world's plenty. Moses saw the invisible, he chose the imperishable, and he did the impossible. But Moses did not just reject certain things in his choice. He also accepted other things in his faith choice. Moses had biblical faith because he rejected the world's provision and then he turned around and wholeheartedly accepted God's provision for him in the Lord Jesus Christ. The person who truly loves God fully accepts Jesus. His finished work on Calvary and Everything else the Lord Jesus stands for. In closing, let's look at God's glorious provision in closing here. Hebrews 11 verse 28. Read with me, please. By faith he, that's Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Now the writer to the Hebrews is referring here to the ten plagues God sent on the Egyptians. If you study Exodus 1 to 11, you will see how it all happened. And the purpose of the ten plagues was so that that old, arrogant, self-centered King Pharaoh of Egypt would soften his heart and let the Israelites leave Egypt to go to the Promised Land. Well, God sent Ten terrible plagues on that land. And every time Pharaoh hardened his heart and refused that the Israelites should leave until the last plague where God decreed the death of every firstborn animal and human in Egypt. God's judgment, in other words. To protect the Israelites, his chosen people, from the terrible plague, God instituted the Passover, where a year old lamb without defect was slaughtered and its blood was sprinkled on the doorposts and lintels of the Israelites' homes. Now, obviously, the blood of that lamb had no power to stave off the angel of death. It could not deal with God's judgment. But sprinkling it exactly as God commanded was an act of faith and obedience on the Israelite side. And even more important, the blood was symbolic of Christ's sacrifice by which God would fully provide all we would ever need for salvation and glory. Escape his judgment and receive eternal life. Now the Israelites and Moses did not fully understand the significance of that ceremony. But they knew 
it was God's or part of God's plan and provision for them and God required it and they simply obeyed they made the choice of faith they accepted God's provision of salvation and protection for them and faith always accepts God's provision no matter how strange and pointless it may seem at the time I must have seemed a little bit silly to the Israelites there, leaving Egypt. I mean, they had not received the Ten Commandments yet, and, you know, doing this strange thing. But faith always accepts, accepts God's provision, no matter how strange and pointless it may be. When a believer accepts Jesus Christ, this is the point, and his work on Calvary by faith for himself, he accepts God's provision. Of salvation the world good works seem like a much better way to please God than simple faith isn't it so but the world's way is not God's way Isaiah says all our righteous acts are like filthy rags before him faith accepts Christ's righteousness the land slain before the foundation of the world for you and on your behalf. Oh, my brother and sister, this is encouragement for believers, but if you are not saved yet, what must you do to be saved? Because the judgment of God hangs over this world. It's going to be destroyed by fire. And after that, the eternal fire, the eternal lake of fire. And that's on all people. The Bible proclaims that quite clearly. And deliverance can't be a political deliverance or a financial deliverance or whatever other deliverance. It must be an eternal spiritual deliverance. But that is what Jesus Christ provides. How can? Well, he is fully God and fully man. A miracle. God came in the flesh as Jesus. He lived the life we couldn't live. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all made a mess somewhere along the line. Even the most righteous person has made huge mistakes. And he dies in our place. He can take the judgment from God in our place because of our sin. And he fully exalts it on the cross. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was for us, for you. And then on the third day, he arose from the dead. We all going to die physically, but those who trust Jesus will be raised from the dead because he was. And then he ascended into heaven where he now rules, and we will join him as his people. But the thing is, is this, the moment you trust in Jesus Christ, you put your faith in Jesus, your account is credited with his righteousness. His death takes the judgment that is due to you for you in your place on the cross. And in your place he was raised from the dead so that you will also be raised from the dead. And he entered the glory where his father is and we will also enter because he opened the gates of heaven for us, for you. But you must trust him no matter where you are, doesn't matter who you are. The biggest Satanist, doesn't matter. The biggest thief, the biggest scallum, it doesn't matter. You come to Jesus and his blood will avail for you. Is that the truth? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, amen. amen. Yes, for sure. Would you like to know the full extent of God's provision for you in Jesus? Listen to this. 
And as I read this, the scriptures, note the centrality of Calvary and the infinite extent of God's provision. You are, or oh, blessed are you on whom the riches and the abundance of God's provision has fallen. Ephesians chapter 1 and from verse 3. Now I know I've read it often. I know it can become all that. But if you're a Christian, this can never be all that. Isn't it so? Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, says the Apostle Paul, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. How? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his son through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And yet he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Jesus Christ. And now this is the apostles. In him we were also chosen, that's Paul, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to open Christ, the apostles, the disciples, might be the, to the praise of his glory. And now, this is us. You were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen? Hallelujah. We are blessed, blessed, blessed in Jesus. It can't get better. You can't have a higher status if you're a Christian. You're God's child. You're a co-heir with Jesus Christ. It's not possible. You can't be loved more. God gave this all for you, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he came and he died for you. More, he can't be. And then we have all the promises in the word. And we have the Holy Spirit with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is the truth. And although I was the preacher here this morning and I'm very limited in what I can express even accurately or even properly. I know nothing, Lord. It is the truth that makes us rejoice. It's you, Lord Jesus that's revealed in the Bible and through your preaching. Thank you, Lord. Bless each one of us this day. Thank you, Lord, that, that we can be for the glory of your glorious grace. And that once we live for the glory of God, we know you are working all things for our good as well. And we thank you in Jesus' name.